All right, so chapter 22. First thing we're going to do, like I mentioned, is we are going to want to recognize these functional groups. If we, can't, if we don't know the functional groups, we can never predict their reactions, right, or keep them separate. So we want to recognize them, and then we're going to learn how to name them. All right, so I just have this first slide that we... Um, that we um, did before, when we were first introducing all of these um, carbonyl derivatives, right? And so these are some of the ones that we're gonna look at in detail. Remember, I mentioned that these are referred to as carboxylic acid derivatives because they are all related to carboxylic acid through a hydrolysis reaction. Okay, so each of these, if we can react them with water, so for example here, this is an acid chloride, and if we react it with water, we get a carboxylic acid as the product, plus something else. Okay, if we react an ester with water, we get a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. If we react an amide with water, we get a carboxylic acid, right? And in this case, we get an amine, right? So we can think about all of these carboxylic acid derivatives as kind of a combination of the carboxylic acid and some other group, right? These are combined to either eliminate water or we can think about it in the hydrolysis direction. Okay, so we're going to look at all of these derivatives, but there are a few additions as well. Okay, first one that we're going to look at are called the anhydrides. Okay, and these really are a combination of two carboxylic acids. Okay, so they're like a carboxylic acid, but they're two of them, but they're linked by a single oxygen. Right? Just like we were <laughs> looking at on the previous slide, if we react this with water, um, we can do this on either side, but I'll draw it like this. Here's our water, and we could end up with one carboxylic acid like this that takes the OH, this is an H there, and the other, another carboxylic acid which takes the H. Okay, so there's the water molecule. OH on one side, H on the other side. Okay? Um, the next group that is included in here are called the acyl phosphates. And these are included, I think, really because they're important in biochemistry. They're not such an important reagent or molecule in organic chemistry, but they have a lot of applications to biochemistry. And so I'm going to introduce them here, but we're not going to really go into them. Okay, and if you want to learn more about them, there's some sections in the chapter that you can read about them, but I'm not going to test you on that, and I'm not going to really cover it in my lecture. Okay, so acyl phosphates are kind of related to anhydrides in that they are the combination of two different acids. Okay. Same as the acid chlorides, or combination of carboxylic acid and hydrochloric acid, right? He, um, here, the acyl phosphates, if we would react this with water, just like all of the other examples here, um, we could go like this, and we could hydrolyze that bond and we would get our OH on this side and then we would get this essentially phosphoric acid on the other side. I'm going to keep the ionization uh, the same as what I have written up there 
Um, but of course, if we, phosphoric acid, if this is an acidic enough medium, then both of these oxygens could be protonated. Okay, so it just has, phosphoric acid actually has three acidic protons, and it can donate one, two, three, right? I think this kind of uh, ionization state is what's, um, and above what you find at neutral pH. Okay? So the acyl phosphates, thioesters as well, are important in biochemistry. And again, we're not going to really study them. So what they have, they're like esters, but they have a sulfur in the place of the oxygen of a normal ester. All right? Like the other cases, if we hydrolyze a thioester, oops, that's not right. Like every other case, we get a carboxylic acid, and in this case, the other reagent is called a thiol. So it's a sulfur analog of an alcohol. Okay, and then the last group here um, isn't really obvious to be a, related to carboxylic acids, um, and these are the nitriles, the carbon nitrogen triple bond. However, if we do treat this with water. Um, in fact, this, kind, this time we have to add in two water molecules. I'm just, I'm not going to do the red on here. To get all the way to the carboxylic acid, but we do get a carboxylic acid plus ammonia. Okay? All right, so we are going to focus on all the groups on the last slide, and the anhydrides and the nitriles, okay? So we're not really going to talk about the acyl phosphates or the thioesters, okay? You can read up on those if you're interested, and if you take biochemistry, you might learn more about those at, at that stage, okay? I think that we're learning enough already right now. Okay, so let's look at some naming then. Okay, so let's start out with the um, acid chlorides. Um, the way that the book does, I, the way I'd always done it before is to start with the parent alkane, but in the text here, they're usually starting with the kind of the parent carboxylic acid. All right, so remember carboxylic acids are named as an alkanoic acid. And so what we do then is for an acid chloride, we're going to cross out the ic acid part, and we're going to add, so we're going to have al, oops, alkane and then I'll do this, oil, and then we're going to list whatever halogen it is. And so for this, we're going to talk about the chlorides. Okay, so if we were going to name these ones that I've got just down below it, if we're going to do it completely IUPAC, then this has two carbons, so ethane, ethanoic acid would be the IUPAC name, and so this would be ethanoyl chloride. All right? We don't usually call that acid ethanoic acid, though. What do we usually call it? If it was an, an acid instead of the chloride. Acetic acid, right? So this is usually just called, so this is more of a common name. Um, dang, I can't spell, though. A 
acetyl chloride. Okay, nobody ever calls it ethanol chloride. All right, so the other ones, the second one, we would do it systematically though. So we have one, two, three, four. So the acid would be butanoic acid. And so this would be butanoyl chloride. <coughs> okay, the last one is kind of a common one, benzoic acid. This is called benzoyl chloride. Okay? All right, so those are the acid chlorides. So here's the anhydrides. So for the anhydrides, really all we do is we cross out acid and we write anhydride. So this would be like alkanoic anhydride. Okay, we can have two types of anhydrides. We can have either what we call a symmetrical anhydride, which have are kind of made up of two of the same carboxylic acid. Okay, and in those cases, we don't have to list those groups twice. We just say once and then anhydride. So again, these we would usually uh, relate to acetic acid, right? They're two carbon acids, so this would be called acetic anhydride. Have you guys made aspirin or anything like that in lab? No. Is that on the lit? Are you doing it later? Okay. You'll use acetic anhydride when you do that reaction. Okay, so then the bottom one, it's four carbons, so this would be butanoic anhydride. All right, since there's two of these butanoic acids, we only have to say it once here. But if we have uh, different groups on each side, this is called a... This is called a mixed anhydride because it's made up of two different carboxylic acids. What we do is we just list the two kind of carboxylic acid groups in alphabetical order, and then we say anhydride. So it's in three different <laughs> words. And so this is, um, so we would have, if we looked at this acid here, right, this is, butanoic this side here right is three carbons this would be propanoic and then we just say anhydride oops and Anhydride. Okay. All right, now esters are a little bit different because we have two different kind of alkyl portions. Or, you know, we have uh, this portion over here, which we're going to be called the alkyl. And this actually comes from essentially an alcohol. And then we're going to have this portion, which is from the acid. And we're going to, instead of doing oic acid, we're going to say O8. So this is the part that tells us that it's an ester. So we have to name both, both parts, though. So we name the alkyl part that, that is attached directly to the oxygen, just as an alkyl group. 
and then in a separate word, so we've put a space between them, then we name the carboxylic acid derived portion. <coughs> okay, so let's just jump into a tricky one here. Look at all that stuff. So what would be the alkyl part? If we name it like I said up there. Cyclohexyl, right? So we would have a cyclo hexyl, and then in the separate word, we would count out our acid here. Five, right? So it would be a pentanoate, and on that pentanoate, we have a methyl group. So it would be three methyl pentanoate. Okay, so whenever we kind of see this, oops, this oate here at the end, then we'll know that there's something we've got to look for out in front. Okay, so we can look for that over here. We used the O8 one other time. Do you guys remember when we used that ending before? Uh, no, not the carboxylic acid on the ring. Yeah. Like sodium benzoate? Yeah, exactly. So when we had the conjugate base, we had a, a salt. Right? So then we had O minus, and if there was a sodium or a potassium or something like that out in front, we said sodium, you know, benzoate or sodium acetate or sodium propanoate. You know, so we use that same ending. And so again, if we say the O8, we'd look back to the front. If we had a cation out there, we'd know it was a carboxylate anion. If we see an alkyl group, we know it's an ester. Okay? So let's do one more here, and then the last one. I'm not going to really name, but I'm just going to point out that it's kind of its own functional group. Okay, so here's our alkyl group. Right, so we're going to draw this down here. So we're going to start with methyl. And then we count out our... Our acid, and we have one substituent attached to it as well. Okay, so what do we call that? The methyl with the oxygen? Methoxy, right? So this is 3 methoxy, methoxy, butanoate. Okay, and there's a space in between here. All right, so we're not going to name this last one, and I think I've said this before, but there's a different name if the ester, so it's essentially an ester, but it's in a ring. Anybody remember what we called that? Lactone. It's called a lactone, exactly right. So we're not going to worry about how to name lactones, but... Maybe we should know that a cyclic ester is a lactone. Okay? Just a little more language. All right, so what do we have? We have the amides. Okay? Amides come in three different types, depending on how many alkyl groups are attached to the nitrogen. Okay? So if we don't have any alkyl groups here, then this is referred to as a primary amide. If we have one alkyl group and a hydrogen, this is a secondary amide. If we have two alkyl groups directly attached to that, this is a tertiary amide. So essentially that tertiary amide, the nitrogen is attached to three different carbons, right? So for amides, I'm just going to start here with the alkane name. We can do it from the acid as well. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to drop the E, and I'm going to write amide. So alk 
Kanamid. Okay. So, if we number these, we're going to start numbering at the carbonyl, of course. So, three carbon primary amide. This would just be propane. Sometimes you just say propanamide. Okay. So the next one, we got to count from the carbonyl as well. So one, two, three. Where, where am I going to count here now? Can we count down around the benzene ring? No, can't do that, right? So we're just going to count out to the end of the chain. And this benzene ring essentially is going to be a substituent. So what do we call it? A phenyl. That's right. All right, so we can name this part. It's five carbons. It has a phenyl group. We'll start way over here. Four phenyl pentane amide. Okay, but there's one more part of the name that we haven't included. I mean, the structure we haven't included yet, right? What's that? The ethyl group. So the ethyl group, though, isn't on position two or three or four or five, right? It's over on the nitrogen. So how do we put into the name that it's actually attached to the nitrogen? Just put an N out in front. Okay, so we're going to call this N ethyl 4 phenyl pentanamide. Okay, so we just put an N that tells us that that alkyl group is attached to the nitrogen. Okay, yeah? Does that tell us, since there's only one that is secondary? <coughs> well, the fact that, that it's an amide and that there's another alkyl group attached to the nitrogen tells us it's secondary. Okay? Um, the N group here, alkyl group, doesn't have to be listed first, right? It's only listed first because ethyl comes before phenyl in the alphabet. Okay? All right, this last one we've actually, you've probably actually seen before. Um, so this only has one carbon on the acid side. So what, what would we usually call a one, you know, we usually we use a common name. What's the one carbon acid? Formic acid, okay? So this would be called, I'm gonna put it all the way down to the bottom, a formamide, okay? And then we have two methyl groups on the nitrogen. So we say N, N, dimethyl formamide. Okay, have you ever heard of this one before? We usually just call it DMF. Have you heard of that before? So what is it? What do we use it for? It's essentially a polar aprotic solvent. So, you know, there was a bunch of those back when you were talking about substitution reactions. And the polar aprotic solvents favor SN2 substitutions. Okay? DMSO, some of those. All right? So you may or may not have talked much about that. Okay, but that's how you name it. Okay, we got one group here, and these are the nitriles. Okay? For the nitriles, it's pretty easy here. We don't drop anything. We just add nitrile. Huh? It's 
it was my stylist's fault. <laughs> okay, alkane nitrile. All right, so um, let's do the one on the right first. So when we number these, we're going to start numbering. Well, we always started numbering before at the carbonyl, right? So here we're going to start numbering at the carbon of the nitrile. So we're going to start numbering here. One, two, three, four, five. All right, so this is going to be a pentane nitrile. All right, and then we have two substituents, right? We have a Chlorine, a chloro at three, and a methyl at four. Okay, so of course the chloro goes first. Three, chloro, four, methyl, pentane, nitrile. Okay, if we have just this simple one here. It's not so obvious, but this is really related to acetic acid as well, because if we hydrolyzed it, like I showed you when, when we were introducing it, the carbon of the nitrile would end up being the carbonyl, and it would be a two-carbon acid then. Okay, so this one is usually referred to as kind of a common name. This is called aceto nitrile. And it's also a, a reasonably common solvent. Sometimes, you know, we haven't really gone into this, and I, I don't know where in the text if it really does this, is naming molecules that really have multiple functional groups. So a lot of the functional groups will, we can name as an ending, and then we can also name them as a prefix. Okay? Like an alcohol. Name, we say uh, propanol, we name it as an ending. But if we had a, something that was a higher priority, then we would name it as a hydroxy, okay, as a prefix. So you might see that sometimes these nitriles are also referred to as um, cyano, right? From like a cyanide. And I think there might be a problem on if it comes up in the homework or something like that, okay? But we haven't really, you know, we aren't really, we haven't really gone over that about, because there is, of all the functional groups, there's like a big priority list. And the higher priority groups get the ending, and the other ones, the weaker ones, are forced to use their prefix. You know, like, uncle, right? You're going to be... <laughs> Say uncle. All right. That was dumb, right? <laughs> All right. So physical properties. Okay. I'm not going to say too much about this. This is just the um, the little table in the book. Um, the main thing here. So um, you know the esters is showing ester and. It, and an acid chloride, and a thioester. And all of these groups have kind of a polar group, so they can have some dipole, dipole interactions, right? And they can have van der Waals interactions between the alkyl portions. Um, but they don't have any, any H's that can do hydrogen bonding. So notice that for these, they all have essentially the same number of heavy atoms, non-hydrogen atoms. And the boiling points are almost the same. The thioester is a little bit bigger, a little higher. Um, but then look at this amide. It, has, it should have the same number. Look at that. It looks like it has one, two, three, four. Yeah, it has the same number of heavy atoms but its boiling point is all the way up at 216. 
So why is its boiling point so high compared to all the other ones? Hydrogen bonding, right? Because the am the amide, um, right? If we draw this amide like this. the hydrogens can get oriented. Remember that hydrogen bonds are really just a dipole-dipole interaction, okay? But it's an important kind, and this would probably line up with the carbonyl oxygen, something like this, okay? And a primary amide could have these kind of hydrogen bonds to both of these H's on the nitrogen, right? And this oxygen could go to a NH on another one. Okay, so a primary amide actually has a higher boiling point than if we took one of these, say that methyl group, we chopped it off and we put it over on the nitrogen, right? It would have the same mass, but then we only have one hydrogen that can hydrogen bond. The boiling point would be lower. Okay, or if we took two of those groups off and we put a dimethyl, and N dimethyl, it would be much more like these over here, right? Because it could no longer have any hydrogen bond. Okay, so where do you think this fits in? So let's compare, um, you know, this is just all the stuff in the chapter. Let's go back to a functional group that we've talked about before. Okay, so here's the... Uh, carboxylic acid that has the same number of, of uh, heavy atoms as that amide, right? And we talked about before how carboxylic acids have much higher boiling points. They can form these dimers. They kind of react like they're a bigger molecule. Where do you think that's going to compare to the amide? Higher or lower, right? <laughs> Flip a coin. I'm going to go with lower. Okay, the boiling point of uh, butanoic acid is 164 degrees Celsius. Okay, so it's kind of in between. It would probably be more similar to the to the secondary amide, right? They both have a single hydrogen bond they can make. Okay? As far as solubilities go, the solubility rules follow basically what we talked about before, carboxylic acids. You know, if they're, they're soluble in all organic solvents, um, if they have a small number of carbons per hydrogen, like less than or equal to five carbons per uh, Per functional group for oxygen, then they're soluble in water. If they have more carbons than five, then it acts more like an alkyl type. You know, the hydrophobic part takes over, and they're insoluble in water. Okay. All right. So I'm already chit chatting out there. All right. Let's do two more. So. As far as physical properties, um, let's compare these carbonyls um, based upon their, uh, the IR absorption of their carbonyl. Okay? And really there's two things going on here. So notice the, the, uh, the acid chloride is at a very high wave number at 1800. The amides are quite a bit lower, down at 1630 to 1680, okay? There's really two things going on here for carbonyls. If we have some kind of Y group like this that is uh, very electronegative, then what can happen is it pulls its electron density this way, and that builds up more delta plus on the carbonyl carbon. It kind of forces this oxygen to donate some of its electron density down to compensate for that. So in that essence, by having a strong electron withdrawing group here, 
This oxygen donates, it adds extra bonding strength between the oxygen and carbon. So for like the acid chloride, which would be doing that, it shifts to the higher wave number range of the carbonyl groups. Okay? If we look at the anhydrides, because there's two carbonyls, we actually get two separate absorptions. Because they can kind of be stretching together like this, or they can be kind of asymmetrical as well, like that. <laughs> um, with that oxygen, it can donate, you know, there's electron withdrawing, but it can also donate. Alright? So it's kind of in the middle. The esters, um, with these other groups, we have um, resonance like this. Right? If this group donates electron density, then we end up with this other resonance form. Like this. And notice that the, this resonance form only has a single bond here. So by having a good electron donating group attached to the carbonyl, we're actually weakening the carbonyl group. Okay, so that's why when we get down to the ester and especially the amide, the nitrogen is much better at donating electrons, so it's kind of weakening this carbon-oxygen double bond strength. So it's at the lower wave number range of the carbonyl stretches. So we can kind of pick out sometimes what kind of carbonyl group we have. I know this will only take you two minutes to do this. <laughs> All right, so this is an IR spectrum and a proton NMR spectrum for this molecule called phenacetin. It's like a pain reliever. All right, and so we got the IR, which isn't uh, like a super great IR. Um, we, are, we don't have time to really sit here and wait for you guys to come up with something here. But uh, <laughs> So what I would see here is this stretch. Does that look like just a normal CH stretch? No, it's too far down. So this is actually an NH. Okay, remember the NH is stretched down in the region where there's the OHs also. And there's only one of them, so that means that it's probably a secondary amide. Remember, if it's a primary amide, there's two NHs, then we see two peaks down there. Okay, and then this is kind of skinny, but it's in the region for a carbonyl. And look, it's way down at like 16 something, so that could fit together with this to form a, to be an amide, okay? Because that's at the low wave number um, end. Okay, so then, so let's say we've got that. And like this, we got a one H there. All right, and that's about what we can pick out of this. So what about the proton NMR? They give you all the integrations. Can you see anything in there? Okay, so these two go together. All right, so if we have a CH2 that's a quartet and a CH3 that's a triplet, what does that tell us? You don't remember any of this stuff? <laughs> this would be an ethyl group. Okay, we have a CH3 that's a, at two point, it's a singlet. That's going to be next to the carbonyl. We have two doublets in the benzene region. Means a para substitution. Okay, so I'm just going to draw this out. Okay, on one side, we're going to have our nitrogen. like this with the methyl group on the end. On the para end, we have an ethyl group, but based upon this chemical shift, 
what has to be between the ethyl and the benzene. If this three down to four. <laughs> it needs an oxygen. All right, I will see you guys on Monday.